Good afternoon. Just doing a, an audio check to see if the audio is working for the lecture this afternoon. Just checking if anyone's there in the questions lectures channel. Wonderful, thanks, Sean. And just checking that the title page is displayed for the Thursday of week 11 lecture. Excellent, thanks, Bailey. Uh, wonderful, I'll um, log off for a few minutes and I'll be back at 4.05 to get underway with the lecture. So, see you in a few minutes.
Okay, uh, welcome to this afternoon's lecture, the Thursday week 11 lecture in NG1003. Uh, let me know on the questions lectures channel if you've got any trouble um, either hearing the audio or seeing the video, you should be able to, um, it should all be up and running now. Uh, I think either Sarah or Brenton will be online in the, in the channel to monitor questions. Um, I'll try and keep an eye on it as best as I can. Okay, so this afternoon's lecture. Um, I'm gonna introduce to you in the space of less than no more than 50 minutes, uh, a, a programming language that sits alongside Python and it's known as MATLAB. Indeed, up until and including last year, uh, Eng1003 introduced uh, MATLAB um, and used it for roughly half the roughly half the semester. And so um, the context for today's lecture is that because of the change in programming language um, from MATLAB in part to, uh, to Python, um, there are some knock-on effects. Um, and I wanna discuss those with you today and to give you some idea of what the MATLAB programming environment is about and to give you a sense of, a, a sense of confidence that if you are a proficient Python programmer to the extent that uh, you've, you've picked up the, the skills in programming in this course, in Eng1003, you'll be very well placed to make a quick transition to MATLAB if you need it. So the, the lecture context for today is why, why we're shifting gears suddenly from Python to MATLAB. What is MATLAB indeed? Uh, and do I even need it? And there's a range of answers to that question. So I'll try and cover them all uh, it, with you this afternoon. Uh, for, those of, uh, for those of you that do need uh, MATLAB, I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of some of the key features in the language details in, in, in MATLAB. Some of them differ from Python, but I have to say uh, the similarities between Python and MATLAB are, um, are significant. So the starting point, and I'll make this point several times today, if you are a proficient programmer in Python, I estimate that you'll be able to make a transition to MATLAB pick up a second language in the form of MATLAB uh, in, in, in a very limited period of time. And I'll finish off just briefly with um, some next steps, how you might go about getting MATLAB if you need it. It's not needed in this course, but if you need it for later courses and a, and a, free, um, a free version of MATLAB should you need it. Okay, context. This year's Eng1003 introduces Python as the sole programming language for the first time. Up until and including last year, this course used a combination of MATLAB and C. Um, there are distinct differences between MATLAB and C, and they largely serve quite different audiences. And so the, the idea of having those two programming languages served served up to students in an introductory course on programming was ultimately deemed um, unworkable. And the decision was made last year that for this year and going forwards, uh, the N2003 course would use Python and Python only. Sounds good. But as a fundamental, a foundation course in computing, it's going to be the base, the base from which many of you will develop uh, further computing um, knowledge. In particular, some of you, depending on your stream of engineering, uh, will, will use some combination of MATLAB <coughs> or C, and in some cases MATLAB and C in later courses. So that puts us in an interesting position. Here we are with an introductory programming course taught in Python, and yet follow on courses that use MATLAB or C and in, in other cases, in, in, in some courses, um, Visual Basic, Excel, VBA. So what I wanna do with you today and on Monday is give you an overview of what MATLAB and C are about. Now, it's taken us 11 weeks to get this far in Python. 
I'm not going to be able to step you through the process of becoming an expert MATLAB programmer in the space of 50 minutes. That's not the intention. I want to give you a, a view from space on what MATLAB looks like. So in the event that you, you take a course uh, next year and beyond that needs MATLAB, you'll have the confidence to, to know that, sure, I learned, I, I was introduced to computer programming through Python, but I can quickly and easily make a transition to MATLAB. And likewise, on Monday's lecture, we'll focus on the C programming language. Now, I'll make a personal reflection. Um, if you're going to choose one programming language to introduce students to, to computer programming, such as in, in 1003, Python is as good a language as, as it gets in terms of uh, teaching the fundamentals. I'll go one step further and say a course, an introductory course that used MATLAB and C and switching gears between those two part way through the course um, would have been a very difficult task uh, to introduce to a, a class of this size and the breadth of requirements. And yet that was the, that was the case. So uh, a personal reflection, uh, one computer programming language is never gonna suit everyone. But if you have to choose one, I, my personal professional opinion would be that Python is, is as good as any and arguably better than any. So what is MATLAB? Uh, MATLAB's a computing environment and a programming language wrapped up together. So uh, it was based in the late 80s. It was started as a, as a, as a, uh, a university project for matrix manipulation. Now, we haven't used the word matrices before in this course. You can think of a matrix as a two-dimensional array, no more, no less. So MATLAB is short for um, matrix laboratory. So it came out of a university setting, although uh, at some point, it became a commercial activity. And so um, that's one of the downsides of, of MATLAB is, it is a, it's a commercial piece of software, which is not a problem in itself, but it has some, has some consequences. Now MATLAB is embedded um, in, 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 in different uh, strands of engineering to, to a greater or less extent, certainly in electrical engineering, mechatronics, aerospace, and some chemical engineering courses use some specialized so-called toolboxes that are, that are tailored towards solving problems in particular um, specific areas. Um, think of a toolbox is MATLAB's jargon for a library. And so there's, there's toolboxes in control design, image processing, machine learning, digital signal processing, computational fluid dynamics, you name it, there's probably a MATLAB toolbox for it, uh, which is great. Uh, and for that reason, MATLAB has been long embedded in the, in the teaching of a number of courses in engineering. And just because the programming language in Eng1003 changed this year, doesn't mean that the knock-on courses will also change to Python. So there'll be some transient period through which you'll probably in those courses um, be required to move from Python to MATLAB and, and maybe those courses in time will themselves move from, from uh, MATLAB to Python, because that's the overall trend in, in, um, in engineering and certainly at, at university courses, that's the overall trend. So we are, we're, not, we're not setting a trend here, we're following a, a global trend. A fair question you might ask at this point is, do we even need MATLAB? And my answer is gonna have a, a number of parts, but let me be absolutely clear for Eng1003. MATLAB is not accessible in this course. There will not be a question in the final exam that touches on MATLAB. However, MATLAB is currently used in, as I said, in a number of later courses in engineering programs, and I've provided a, a list. I don't pr pretend it's exhaustive, but it's a, pretty com it's a pretty comprehensive list at the bottom of slide five there. And you'll see the course codes that, that MATLAB is currently used in. So when, when I ask the question, do we even need MATLAB? The simple answer is not for this course. The, the extended answer is, do, do you need MATLAB for later study in your program? Almost certainly yes, in certain strands of engineering. In some, no, in, in others, substantially. But I, I can't stress it enough, MATLAB is not accessible in Edge 1003 from this year on. 
So what I want to do in about half an hour or, or a, little, a little more is give you some sense of what MATLAB looks like, what are the similarities, and what are some of the key differences with Python. So the starting point is that MATLAB is a proprietary closed source piece of software. Proprietary means it, the, the, the licensing is managed by a, a commercial entity, um, the company MathWorks. And uh, closed source software means that uh, MathWorks are guarded about how their software actually works. Uh, you buy, you, you, you license uh, certain toolboxes for MATLAB and you can look inside to see how those toolboxes work. But if you get right down to tin tax and you want to know how the base algorithms work in MATLAB, MathWorks don't share that information with you. Now that might not be a problem, but um, the point is it's a proprietary piece of software. And a MATLAB license is free for students. I've got a link on the very, the very final slide of today's lectures, which points you to where you can, you can access a copy of uh, the MATLAB license for free as, a, as an enrolled student. That's great, up until the point at which you graduate, at which point a commercial MATLAB license is very expensive, thousands of dollars um, to, to, get a, to get a seat license for, for MATLAB. So MATLAB has been great and it's been the, the bedrock of certain courses in engineering for 20 or more years as part of our teaching. On the other hand, Python's free and open source. You all know it's free. You all accessed Python uh, through with the PyCharm integrated development environment at the start of semester. And while there were a few wrinkles, uh, none of you had to actually break out your wallet and, and pay for, 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 for the Python or PyCharm at all. It's open source so that if you're interested, you can dig down and see all the details of how all the algorithms are implemented if you're interested. Uh, most, most people aren't, most engineers aren't, but the point is, being open source, there's a very vibrant online community that maintains um, the, the Python code base and it's growing very rapidly. And so Python's, it's free, open source, and you can keep programming in Python once you graduate for, for zero cost. And interestingly, we've had a number of our industry advisory groups for our different programs come to us and say, we want your graduates to uh, be uh, knowledgeable, competent, in programming in Python. So there's not many courses that in first semester, first year of your engineering program, you're developing skills that employers uh, are requesting um, of, our, of our graduates. So um, MATLAB and Python, are, as I said, they're both popular programming environments. Python's got roughly double number of users if you use that as a measure of popularity. Um, it, it added as half as many users in 2018 as half as many users as MATLAB has in total. Uh, uh, there are different uh, professional communities that that employ Python, and um, electrical engineering has a has a ranking through the IEEE Association um, and ranks its uh, popularity of languages as opposed to as to what they're being used for for developing projects in in the area of engineering electrical engineering and Python's number one. So not only are you learning a great language that teaches the fundamentals of programming um, in, a, in a very uh, accessible way, uh, it's, it's a popular language out there in, in industry. Um, there are all sorts of similarities between the functionality of Python libraries and MATLAB toolboxes. And I'll pick up on a couple of those today. Um, it's certainly not the case that MATLAB and Python are identical, but I have to say I've been a very long-term programmer of MATLAB and a relatively uh, relatively new to Python, and the transition's been um, pretty smooth. Um, I have to say, very smooth. Um, there's a link at the bottom of page seven there, which points you to a lovely web page that I found, which talks about making the switch from MATLAB to Python. It's uh, a trend globally for the reasons I've identified for the advantages of Python over MATLAB. Um, there's a trend from MATLAB to Python and the, the link that I've got at the bottom of the page spells out a lot of the whys and the hows if you do that transition. I suspect if we were to jump in a time machine and, and move five years forward, I suspect 
that, that most, if not all the courses in our engineering program that currently use MATLAB will use Python. Um, that's, that's a, that's a, you know, I don't have a time machine, but that's, that's, that's what I would expect if I jumped in it and went forward five years and probably less than five years. So just a little overview of what, what MATLAB looks like, just so that in the courses that you encounter later in your program, you don't say, what on earth is MATLAB? I don't know anything about it. I learned to program in Python, and now this course is expecting me to, to have some knowledge of MATLAB. I've picked out half a dozen areas in which, uh, in, in, in which I'm going to focus on today. I should say Sarah's picked these out because Sarah and I jointly wrote the slides today. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that any student that passes ENG 1003 so has a level of proficiency at Python, I reckon you could transition to MATLAB in one or two weeks. I reckon you could do it in a couple of days, given the right, given the right motivation, given the right problem to solve. Um, one of the things I'll be doing today is showing you Python and MATLAB code side by side. And almost without exception, I would say, I'm going to say without exception, every single case that you look at, you sort of say, oh, yeah, that looks pretty familiar. Um, if, if you knew Python and you were given some good documentation on, on, the, on MATLAB syntax, you could make that transition. I'm very, I'm very confident of that. Um, in fact, I, I don't think it would take you two weeks. I think with the right problem setting, you could do it in a, uh, a week, a few, a few days. Um, there they really are some very, very strong familiarities. And some of those familiarities are not accidental. Okay, so just a little bit of syntax. Before, before I do that, let me just, let me just boot up the, what a MATLAB environment looks like. I'm just going to start MATLAB for you on my machine just to show you that it looks in its own way uh, like the PyCharm environment. It, it looks different, but it's got some similarities. So it just takes a minute to boot up. If you want a license like I'm booting up here now, then um, the link on the final page for you um, in today's lectures will, will get you up and running, but you don't need it for this course. So what we see here in front of us is the is the MATLAB environment. Down on the right, in the bottom right hand, the bottom right hand corner, we've got a command window. That's sort of like the PyCharm console. So we can type something here. We can type X equals um, 10 and have that mirrored back to us. That's the value of the variable X. And up in the, up in the workspace editor, a viewer up in the top right hand corner, it shows us that there's now a variable which takes on the value 10. On the left, I've got some code that's just like we've got a we've opened an, an, an editor in, in PyCharm. So um, at, at the command line, anything that begins with a with a, uh, a percentage sign is a comment and just gets ignored by by the interpreter. If we type the comment without the percentage sign, we get an error because MATLAB doesn't know about the variable comment yet. Um, uh, if we want to display a variable, we can display it using disp, whereas in, uh, I'm just trying to think, I can, don't know if I can make this any bigger. This is good enough for the moment. Um, if I disp display a variable, it'll tell me what the value of the variable is. One interesting difference is with Python is if you just type the variable, it tells you what it is. If you type a variable with a semicolon at the end, it suppresses the value of that variable. Okay. So that's sort of what the MATLAB environment looks like. Command line, which is like a console, a place where you can edit code and, and a little workspace editor that you can use to check the value of variables. So there are some syntactic differences between MATLAB um, and, and Python, and you'll see a number of those as we, as we look at some examples. In terms of mathematics, arithmetic and relational operators, everything is just about the same between MATLAB and, and Python. 
So you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Um, same in MATLAB as they are for Python. One difference is that whereas Python uses the double asterisk for exponential, MATLAB uses an up arrow. So let's, we'll just do that at the command line just to see that that's the case. I don't know if I can make this any bigger. I wish I could make the font bigger here. I don't know if I've got the ability to do that. Hmm. I'm conscious that that's likely to be very small for you, but I don't know how to make it any bigger. We'll leave it for the moment. Otherwise I'll, I'll end up losing my, my window. Okay, so let's take, let's suppose we've got X is equal to uh, what value of 10. 10 squared is 100. Um, whereas Python would use 10 star star two. That doesn't work in MATLAB, it's 10 up, 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 up arrow. Um, all the relational operators are the same, equals, greater than, less than, lesser equals, and so on. Um, MATLAB uses tilde equals instead of exclamation mark equals for not equal to. So you can see that, that you know, that, that sort of the, there's, there's a lot of similarity. Um, one difference is that uh, uh, a variable whose value has been assigned, the variable A, giving it the value three, um, by default, that value is printed, including inside a script that you write. Uh, so if you want to suppress the value of that printing, you just append a, a semicolon to the end. And I demonstrated that for you in the console um, at the, in the command line a, a few minutes ago. We'll do it later in, in some code that's actually going to run live. So that's, that's some basic syntax, commenting, um, how to display a variable. The, the arithmetic and relational operators are basically the same, which means that if you see some code that's heavy on arithmetic and um, relational operators, like checking if, if one quantity is less than another, actually Python code looks very similar to MATLAB. Um, there are some differences here in the way that uh, flow control works, but basically if I was to show you Python code, and I'll do that in a moment, Python code for if else, Python code for for loops and while loops. It looks very similar to MATLAB. So there's some rules there. I'd rather show it to you in context. Here's two pieces of code. At the top half of the top half of the slide is uh, code in Python, and that if you actually cut and paste this these lines one to seven, the first seven lines into the PyCharm editor, you could run this as a script. Uh, notice that Python uses the, the hash symbol as a, a, a beginning of a comment. MATLAB uses the percentage symbol. But if you look at the K, if you just sit back and look at it, they look very similar. What are the differences? Well, you'll see that at the end of the first line of the MATLAB code, I've got a semicolon. I'm going to run this code for you in a minute so you can see these, these effects live. But if that semicolon was missing, the value would, of num equals 10 would be displayed in, in the console, in the command line. Um, the if condition, the language is almost the same. Python uses elif, MATLAB uses else if. Um, Python if statements are terminated with, with, with colons, MATLABs are not. Um, Python uses indenting to specify what the, what the terms are that are executed in a conditional or a nested if else statement. Um, MATLAB doesn't require that. It's a good idea to do it because it makes your code more readable. MATLAB terminates the if statement with an end. Python doesn't, it uses, it uses indentation. So you can see if you, were, if you were pointed towards some decent documentation for MATLAB, you could translate that Python code to MATLAB or more realistically go from MATLAB back to Python um, pretty easily. So let's just run that code. Now I've typed this in a few minutes ago. Again, I apologize, it's not bigger. I wish I could make the font bigger. I don't know how to do that. Hmm. Let me just leave it for now. So if I run this code, Um, you'll see that at the end of the first line, 
maybe you can't easily see it, but at the end of the first line, there's the, the first line says num equals 10. That's the first line of the MATLAB code in the, in the lecture notes. If I run that script, you'll see that the message, uh, that the, the value of num is displayed to the, to the command line. If I use a semicolon to suppress that, the value is still assigned, it's just not displayed on the, in, the, in the command window. So those, that code looks, so if I wanted to change the value to 50, 150 and run it, we get the num equals 100, 150 displayed on the command line. If I semicolon at the end, just runs the code, but doesn't doesn't display the doesn't display the value. So that's pretty good news. We're already doing some powerful things. We've got we've got the ability to write um, for loops. Um, oh, if statements and for loops, where the flow control um, is very similar to Python. Here on page thirteen, you can see a for loop that adds the integers from one to 10. And if you were to write the code in, in Python, we'd have a, we'd initialize a running sum. We'd then uh, iterate I over the range using this range statement one to 11, which we know now would run from one to the number before 11, which is one to 10. Um, and, then, and then progressively sum up those um, values. The same code in MATLAB takes four lines because we've got an end statement that terminates. Um, otherwise, the code looks very similar. Two differences. One is we use the semicolons to suppress the display of these variables. And the biggest difference between these pieces of, of code is the way that the for loop's set up. MATLAB, to my mind, uses a more natural indexing. And, it, and if we want to loop to add the integers from one to 10, we use a for loop that runs from one to 10. So the statement one colon 10 is short for, from use the integers spaced by one, starting at one, spaced by one up to 10. So we can, let's do that. I, I don't know if you can actually see it, but I'll, I'll do it live and hope that at least some of you can see it. If I type the, the one to 10, I get the numbers one to 10 displayed. If I go one, in jumps of one to 10, so one colon, one colon 10, I get the same result. If I use one colon two colon 10, it, it, it iterates over the numbers from one to 10 in steps of two. Okay, just bear with me, Sarah just sent me a message. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Um, preferences, got it, excellent, font, try, thanks Sarah, I think Sarah's just pointed me towards uh, making the font bigger, so hopefully you can see it, now hopefully that's better, look better? Excellent. Okay, so uh, let me back up. One to 10 in MATLAB gives us the numbers, the integers one to 10. Let me just make it one to eight so it'll fit. One to eight. One in steps of one to eight gives the same list. One in steps of two up to eight gives the numbers um, spaced by a gap of two. So this is a, like a step, a step size. So here's our variable x equals 10. It's displayed to the console. X equals 10 with a semicolon does exactly the same thing. It just suppresses the dis suppresses the display. And so that's there's a for, there's a for loop that adds the integers from one to 10, quite similar. Um, and with a bit of practice, you could move backwards and forwards between those. Given your knowledge of Python, if you were dumped in a found yourself in a course that um, assumed a base level of knowledge of MATLAB you could make that transition pretty easily. Here's uh, another example where we use a while loop. We've now seen if, then, else. We've seen a for loop. 
here's a while loop, the third form of flow control. Suppose we wanted a while loop that found the smallest integer, which when it was squared was greater than 100. Um, here's the Python code to do it. We'd, um, we'd initialize our value at one. We'd, 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 we'd initialize a, um, a, a quantity that we used then in a, in a conditional. Uh, n squared being is while ever n squared is less than 100, that's the, the uh, specification of our program. We could then increment n and then update the value of n squared. Notice here the syntax for n squared in Python is n star star two, whereas the equivalent statement in MATLAB is n um, uh, caret uh, up arrow um, two. Otherwise, the code looks pretty similar. There's a colon at the end of the, the conditional in MATLAB in Python, but not in MATLAB. Otherwise, the code's pretty similar. What about arrays? Um, MATLAB arrays work a lot like NumPy arrays. Um, and if you can work with NumPy arrays, you'll find MATLAB arrays uh, equally easily. And in particular, they both do vectorization in the same way so that we know now that we can operate on arrays of numbers either one at a time or write expressions which operate on the whole array at one time. And uh, both of them do vectorization in a, I'm not gonna say the same way, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna modify that to say a very similar way. Um, here's a statement where, uh, it, the first two lines here where we've got Python code where we can create an array and then access a, an element of it. Same code in MATLAB, create an array, it's actually a slightly simpler syntax, and then we can access an element of it um, where this I value is the, the index of the value that we want to access within the array. Now, one thing that is different between um, Python and, and MATLAB is array indexing. So let's do this. I've just created an array called ARR, and there it is. The first element of AAR is indexed by one in MATLAB. Notice how different that is to Python. In Python, we would access, let me, we would, there's the AR, the ARR array, that's a long word. Let me call it X. There's the X array, we've just created it. The first, the, 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 the first entry of X is indexed with one in MATLAB. It's not indexed with zero as it would be in, in, in Python. The, the MATLAB um, interpreter complains if we try and access the zeroth element because it's not defined. That's one difference. It's subtle, but it's also got um, widespread uh, ramifications in translating code from MATLAB to Python and back. Looks like such a simple, in some ways, um, I think MATLAB uses the more natural setting um, although that, that's that's a that's a matter of personal preference. You can also do array slicing just like you would in in um, in, in Python. Suppose that was our array, 10, 20, 30. And suppose we wanted to pick out the first and second elements of the array. We could pick out X where the indices ran from one to two. Or we could pick out the X values that went from two to three. If we try to access the fourth element of X, what's gonna happen? It'll complain because the, there is no such thing as a fourth index of X. So there's X equals um, 10, 20, 30. If we want to pick out the first and third elements, we can do, oh, we can do this. Uh, um, how do we do that? Let me just, no. Let, let's, let's leave it at that for the moment. So that's one difference between um, MATLAB and um, and, and, and Python is that the array indexing is, is different. Two dimensional arrays, quite similar. Uh, whereas in Python, the instructions to 
create a two-dimensional array are shown at the top of the top of the page. I'll type that into MATLAB and let's do it live. This is on page 16. Okay, A equals two, two, three. Semicolon is used to denote the end of the first row, four, five, and then so the A array is displayed for us as a as an as an array. The first row of which is here, the second row of which is here. If we wanted to add a third, a third row, we could do that. And we can do slicing the same way if we want to pick out the first row of A. It's one. Here, if we want to pick out the first column of A, it's this one. So there's A. The first column of A is all the row elements in the first column. So you can see there are some similarities, but also some differences. It's a bit like learning, if you'd learned Italian, I'm sure learning French as a second language um, would be, would, would, be um, would be more straightforward. Um, bottom of page 16, MATLAB, if, if this is, this is uh, coming up as an issue in the assignment, um, where if you, you want to create a, uh, in MATLAB, probably does the more natural thing if you want to B equals A, and if A is uh, an array, a, a variable, um, or a, a two-dimensional array, um, by default, B creates a new a, a new version. Whereas in in Python, we need to actually create uh, a new a new object. And in this case, an array with it with a copy function. So there are some differences. I've highlighted the one here on page seventeen that the one that I ran through uh, with you live in in the MATLAB command line. Um, array indexing from MATLAB starts at one. In Python, starts at zero. And I've already given you the syntax of the, the way to create an array that runs over um, from five to 100 in steps of one, for example. The syntax in MATLAB is start, step, end, starting at five in increments of one up to 100. So we can do that if you like. We'll say A is equal to five in steps of one up to 100. And it'll happily display a large array for us, um, even though we've got to, have to scroll back through it to see all the values. If we wanted to create that array, but suppress the display, semicolon at the end does that for us. It's the same array, it's just not displayed to the screen. If we wanted to say A equals five in steps of five up to 100, let's do it in steps of 10 up to 100, and then display it to the screen, starting at five in steps of 10 um, and, and stopping, um, uh, stopping at no later than 100. If we add 10 to 95, we get 105, which is beyond the end of the index, the specified index. Plotting is really similar in MATLAB to Python, um, deliberately so. And in fact, um, the, the, the library we've been calling from, from week one to do our display in, in Python has been the matplotlib um, library and the naming of that library has been chosen deliberately to echo the to echo MATLAB and so the plot functions are basically the same if you can do plotting in Python plotting in MATLAB is is essentially the same here's an example it's the most complicated example we've seen so far um, we've got two pieces of code here. The top code, you're probably sick of seeing. You saw it multiple times earlier in the course where we created a, a time array. And we also specified a couple of variables, V0 and, uh, and G. These were, the, these were constants that appeared in an expression for the, the height of a, um, a rocket or a football um, as a function of time. So the first four lines of the Python code create two scalar variables, V0 and G, create an array variable T, and then line six was a really powerful statement in Python, 
because it's a vectorized uh, uh, calculation of the, the height where we create a new array y, which depends on the constants v0 and g. And it also depends on the array t. And that, and that this expression six, Python's clever enough to interpret that expression as evaluating the, uh, the expression for every single value of t in the, in the t array. Here's the equivalent code in MATLAB. Looks very, uh, very similar. Define the variables v0 and g. Define the time vector starting at zero in increments of 0 0.001 up to one. And then here's the vectorized expression for the height. The trickiest part of this, and I'm just going to flag it with you uh, because I, I suspect the first time you actually write code to, to evaluate such an expression like this in MATLAB, you probably have to go back to your notes and, and, and remind yourself how vectorization happens in MATLAB. It happens slightly different to the way it does in Python. Python, you just write the expression out, t, t squared, for example. In, in MATLAB, uh, it's t dot up arrow two. So vectorization is not quite the same in MATLAB as it is in, in Python. I'd argue that's, a, that's some, something of a detail. Let, let's just step back. Look at the code that you see there in front of you on page 19. It's code which creates a couple of scalar variables, a one dimensional array, uses vectorization to plot, uh, to calculate the height of a particle as a function of time, and then displays that height as a function of time. The code for MATLAB and Python are almost identical. There are some differences, but if you are a competent um, Python programmer, having completed Bench 001003, I'd argue that you'd be able to make this transition to the MATLAB code pretty quickly. And the, the areas you make, you learn from them, um, and it's not, it's not a fundamentally um, more difficult programming environment. I'll tell you one thing I do like, it's I've skipped over it, but let me just reflect on it for just a minute. One thing that I think Python does a lot better than MATLAB, it's implicit in, in the code that you see in front of you. I was in a face-to-face -face lecture. I'd pause at this time and, and ask you to tell me what the difference is. There's one really key difference. So I skipped over it. It's, um, it's the import statements in, in Python where we're, um, we're importing the NumPy library and we're importing the use of the matplotlib library. There's no such, there's no such expressions in, um, in, in MATLAB. There's no import statement and there's no, there's no syntax that looks like this at the top that I'll highlight in Python. That might appear like a benefit of MATLAB that you don't have to do it. I'd argue the opposite. Python's wonderful at being very precise about which libraries it uses to implement with what, what, which functionality. MATLAB either uses built-in functions or as you develop your own functions, it'll, MATLAB will attempt to find those somewhere on your hard disk somewhere. Now there is a, there is a precise um, procedure for going about setting up your integrated development environment so, it, so MATLAB knows where to find functions. But as you write more and more sophisticated code, there's examples, they, they actually occur quite often where a function that you write has got the same name as a function that, that's available in a library somewhere. And in MATLAB, it's a bit of a mess to try and tease out, do you mean the function that you wrote? Or do you mean the function that's built into a library? Or do you mean a built-in function? Um, the import statements in Python make it really clear that if you're going to use the linspace function, for example, it's the one that appears in the NumPy library. So it's, a, it's something of a subtle error, a subtle difference, but it, it's a really powerful one. And I think it's an advantage of Python. It, it, it avoids those, those, those clashes. Um, and the final, the final point I'd make here is that MATLAB functions work quite similarly between Python and, and, uh, 
and MATLAB. I've got two functions at the bottom of this slide here, which uh, create a function that returns the addition of two numbers that are provided as, as arguments. There are some differences, whereas the Python code uses def to define a function called addition, MATLAB uses the, 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 the keyword function. Um, whereas there's a colon at the end of the, the Python function definition, there's no such colon in, in MATLAB. Whereas the, the, the calculation line in the, in the MATLAB code is, suppresses the, the display of, of, of the value with a semicolon, there's no such semicolon required in, um, in, in Python. Whereas there's a return statement, explicit return statement needed in Python, it's implicit or it's, it's, it's done in a different way. In Python returns the value that's being computed using the return total statement, whereas in MATLAB, the, the value that's returned is specified as an argument in the, in the function definition. So there are some differences there. The one that I find the most useful in Python, it's coming up in the assignment, which is the, the, the use of um, variable numbers of arguments and default values for input arguments to functions. I think Python's implementation is a lot, um, a lot easier to follow than, than MATLAB. Now, conscious that we've covered a lot of detail, we looked at some syntax, we looked at um, some arithmetic and relational operators, we looked at flow control, we looked at plotting, we looked at, um, at, at functions and we looked at arrays all in the space of about half an hour. Uh, if you've never seen MATLAB before, then I can guarantee you're not a MATLAB programmer yet. On the other hand, if there was one message I'd like you to take away from today's lecture, it's, the, it's that you have the confidence that if you encounter MATLAB in the remainder of your program, and for the most of you, you probably will, I'm gonna stand by the statement that if you're familiar with Python to the extent that it's covered in this course, in Engine 1003, I reckon you can make a MATLAB transition in one or two weeks as, as part of your learning in those, in those later courses. So don't let anyone tell you that the fact that you've learnt the fundamentals of programming in Python means that you're ill-equipped to uh, use some toolbox functions in MATLAB. Uh, I, I'm strongly of the view that that's not the case and that having learned the fundamentals in Python, you'll be very well placed to make that transition if and when you need to. So if you do need MATLAB, um, remember it's not accessible in this course. Um, I've provided a link here. It's hot linked into the, into the PDF and that'll take you to the, the site from IT services at the university that'll allow you to download a, a full and free and um, completely legitimate licensed copy of MATLAB while you're an enrolled student um, and you can be ready to use it if you need it in later courses, won't be needed in this course. Uh, you might also consider there's a, um, a MATLAB-like software environment developed by the new, new uh, organisation known as Octave and Octave is uh, a free um, implementation of something that's very similar to MATLAB, not identical, but very close. Um, and it's completely free and, op and open source. So um, sort of a middle ground in that it's, it's open source. Uh, it'll run and, and you're able to run code that's, it'll, the Octave environment will run most MATLAB code. Okay, so I'm conscious that that was quite a quick view, um, but I, if I were you, I would, I would tuck this set of slides away for future reference. Um, I'm completely confident that having been introduced to the fundamentals of computing in Eng 1003 via Python, you're well placed to um, make a transition to MATLAB should you need it. Uh, a view to next week, we'll do a similar high level um, look at, at uh, the, the C programming language. My message there will be slightly different to the one for MATLAB. But um, until I see you on Monday morning, I'll say bye for now.